Hi, everybody. Um, welcome. Um, my name is Rob. Um, I'm uh, one of the surgeons at uh, Northern Ireland Veterinary Specialists. Um, and uh, yeah, when I wrote this talk, I kind of essentially wrote the title before I actually wrote the content, which um, rather hampered me a little bit. Um, and uh, essentially what I'd start out by saying is a disclaimer. This is not a comprehensive guide to um, elbow or knee issues, but really just a, a sort of a simple overview of some of the things that are common um, and that we see most frequently. Um, and um, to get it started, I thought what we might do um, is um, do a little poll. This is if I can get it to do its thing. Here we go. And uh, just see how we get on with this. So we want to be asking is uh, what is the commonest lameness diagnosis in dogs? So let's see if you guys can stick a few things in to see. There's no wrong answers in this. Um, uh, there's no, no answers at all. We can basically just guess, see what you like. And uh, it's just interesting to see what people think is the most common thing. We've got uh, various different answers coming in now. This is good. This is great. Nearly most, well, wow, nearly most people have voted now. This is great. So we'll, uh, we'll just end that there. And uh, I'll just share the results with you. And uh, here we go. I, I think you can probably see that on your screen, but I'll show that as on my screen as well. Um, so most people are saying they're osteoarthritis, um, coupled with claw injury. Um, and a few with sort of cruciate um, ligament disease. So I'll just stop sharing that for a minute. Um, and that's interesting, really. Um, a lot of you are right um, in terms of what the most common cause of lameness is. Um, the uh, RVC Vet Compass Group um, look at this data, uh, and osteoarthritis um, is uh, the most common diagnosis that's sort of recorded um, with uh, problems like cruciate ligament disease and patella luxation, hip dysplasia and things uh, down here. Um, but the problem with this is that, that arthritis isn't really a definitive diagnosis in dogs and it's invariably caused by another primary condition. And identifying and understanding and treating the underlying cause is really the best way to manage that arthritis. Arthritis in dogs, the majority of the times, is, is a secondary disease. And as vets, and one of the reasons I kind of got into being a vet is, you know, we wanted to provide the best treatments um, and give the best outcomes and care for, for all the pets that are under our care. I mean, you know, that's sort of why we got into it in the first place. And what we want to be doing is, is rather than treating the symptoms, treating the underlying cause. So we want to be, you know, turning this on its head um, and getting really to the bottom of, of what's causing um, the problem. Now, uh, I don't know about you, but uh, how many times have you you had an owner say, "Well, you know, that's not my pet. That's that's my baby." Well, this is my baby, um, Alice. Um, a little bit of a lockdown puppy. She's a little rescue. Came in. She's got pulmonic stenosis, um, but uh, she's lovely. And in many ways, you often have clients come in and say, "Well, you know, this is this is my baby. So I want to do everything as I would if it was genuinely my child." And if it was your child, you know, you might demand more and um, you know, well, why not for our pets and uh, demand more outcomes, better outcomes for our patients? And one of the things that at NIVS, uh, one of the core values, one of the things that we want to do is to become an extension of your team um, and to provide a, an extension to the services that you can offer to your clients by providing you access to advanced imaging, specialist care and treatments, and hopefully as a result, better outcomes and results and therefore better relationships as well with your clients. Um, and that's some of what we're sort of going to look at today. Um, so the next thing I'm going to look at again is um, another little poll. And uh, we're just having a little look at this because this is how um, dogs come in. Um, just a little what we think is which leg is the dog lame on? Simple question. Um, and uh, let's just see what, what people are saying. Um, again, this dog, this case has been and gone, um, so you can't really get it wrong. No worries. Let's just have a little look, see what you think. 
Okay, nearly. Yep, yeah, come on. Everyone has a few more of you left to have a go. And this is the thing, you know, it's nice having a video and just have a little, have a little look. Super. So, oh, we still got a few people voting, which is good. Well done. So I'm just going to end that poll now and uh, share the results. Now, the interesting thing with this is uh, the majority of, of people have said uh, left thoracic limb lameness, um, but almost an equal number of you have said right thoracic limb lameness. Now, as a bunch of vets, if we can't make our minds up, then actually, how can we expect the owners to make their minds up? And this is just something that's really, really important is it's a bit like the way House would say, you know, everybody lies. Um, for vets, it's very much that don't necessarily believe anything the owner tells you. Um, owners will barely understand which leg the dog is lame on. Um, and this particular dog, you can see his uh, head goes down on his right thoracic limb. And often that can be thought, well, that's probably right thoracic limb lameness because that's the most obvious sign that we can see is head, that head nod is going down on that right side. But actually what we're seeing there is that's the weight that we're seeing, the weight that is being pushed down on that, that right um, thoracic limb lameness. And uh, this dog's therefore lame on the left. So the majority of you are right, um, but it's just a question of interpretation. Um, and I guess that's really important, particularly um, when when we uh, you know look at uh, you know issues in with, with the owners as well. So never trust the owners is basically what I'm saying. Um, so we've got another one here. This is a little bit trickier. Um, so we'll uh, just launch poll, poll again. See what we make of this one. This is a slightly more challenging um, lameness to spot. Um, and, and that's okay. We've got one for no idea and that's totally cool. That's good. And the other key thing to realize with this is sometimes it's not obvious, um, you know, what, uh, you know, wh where, where a dog is lame. That seems to be struggling there. Let's just see if we can get that playing again for you. Um, and as we watch it, you know, what's the dogs walking and taking videos can be really helpful in terms of um, looking back at them, watching them in slow mo, uh, and uh, you know, evaluating um, the, the lameness. So, I'll just end that one there and uh, share those results with you. Um, so, again, pretty, pretty mixed results on that one. Um, this dog actually has. Um, a, a right um, pelvic limb lameness. It's got quite an odd um, grade four um, medial patella luxation in this leg with due to a, quite a marked tibial valgus um, that is uh, causing this foot to be, be out of place. Um, it's quite subtle and it's quite difficult to see. It just makes you use for, for realizing that, you know, taking videos and by all means, you know, if you're not sure, send them to us. We're more than happy to have a little look. Um, but, uh, you know, it's it's okay not to know. Um, so take some video and by all means send it in and, and, and give us some uh, give us some ideas. Uh, and then let's let's try again with this one. Um, gonna have same thing again. Which leg is lame? So this is again a little bit more subtle. This one it's not as obvious. Let's see how we get on with that. And the key thing in this video is that this dog isn't lame the whole time. He's lame a little bit at the start and then he stops. As he slows down, it becomes less obvious. And that's a key. So when we're looking at dogs walking, sometimes we want to see them walk at the trot. Sometimes we want to see them walk um, actually just walking slowly. Some dogs, the lameness is more obvious whilst they're trotting. Sometimes it's more obvious when they're walking slowly. Sometimes it's more obvious when they're walking on tarmac or they're walking on grass or they're walking on gravel. So spending some time with these um, can be um, really worthwhile. So just gonna end the poll there, share the results. Again, a fair bit of, of disagreement um, and that's okay. Um, this dog, um, as we can see, at this point in the video, it's quite low. At this point here, you can see it head nod down there on the left leg. So it's actually the right leg that's lame in this dog. This dog actually uh, had a humeral endocondylar fissure. 
anyways that's uh we'll just stop sharing that and uh come back to those um, in a minute um the other thing to say is again if you can't work out where a dog is lame um just from looking at them uh examine them and then take another look you might find as you're pushing and pulling them around that you uh that you can exaggerate the pain and when they walk again it's more obvious so really what i want to give you is a is a cheat's guide to orthopedics um partly because we can see the last few videos sometimes it's difficult to work out where a dog is lame and therefore what do we do you know in that in that scenario so this is my cheat's guide and it is a cheat's guide so it means that sometimes this will be 100 percent wrong but a lot of the time if you've got a dog that's lame on its front leg it's most likely going to be the elbows unless your physical exam reveals otherwise or if you're struggling to find something on your physical exam consider most likely the problem's going to be the elbow unless it's a, a sight hound in which case it's more likely to be something with the foot more likely to be a problem with a corn or a sesamoid disease or something like that but for the majority of dogs you've got a thoracic limb lameness consider it to be the elbows so let's have a look at elbows how do we look at elbows well the first thing we're going to do is to um, examine both of the limbs um, and uh, have a feel of them have a feel of the muscle mass run your your hands down you know the the scapular spine um, down the triceps all, all the muscles and try and do it both sides at the same time and then specifically when we're looking at the the elbows we want to look at the range of motion um, we want to put that through extension and flexion when you're putting a dog's leg into, into flexion, you can hold the wrist and gently um, uh, sort of pronate and supinate that. And you might find that that um, can um, exaggerate pain uh, response and, and show uh, some response. And sometimes a dog's response can be quite um, minimal. It might be just that it's moving his, his body weight away from you, shifting his weight onto the other leg. It might not be sort of yelping or turning towards you. Sometimes it's as, it's as little as just moving their weight away from the movement that you're doing. You're also feeling for any sort of physical abnormalities like medial thickening um, or stability or any pain when palpating over the, the, the condyles. One of the key things that we want to do um, is, uh, is to compare both legs. Um, and usually what I do is actually just start with the completely normal leg, which throws owners a little bit, um, but start with the normal leg. And that way the dog can get to know you a bit. It can, uh, you know, get used to the activity. And it also gives you a sort of uh, a, a point of how that dog reacts to that, what's normal for it. And when you get onto the little side that is lame, it's much more likely that you're going to find out where the problem is. So the next part of, sort of diagnosis is, is radiographs. Um, and I'd like to do another little poll here um, and see what people think. Again, there's no right or wrong answer to this. Um, it's just going to see what you think. Um, and the, basically the question here is, are radiographs worthwhile in investigating elbow disease? Um, for some, maybe they are, maybe they're not. Um, just see what you think. All right. OK, that's great. Um, so just going to share the results of that. We've got most of the people there. Um, and uh, I think I tend to agree with with the majority of people there. Um, as I said, there's no wrong answers. Um, I'd say that for me, yes, radiographs are often worth it, but they do have a low sensitivity and they might miss things. But it can also tell you a lot of inf useful information. It's never wrong to take x-rays um, and um, you can absolutely just go straight for CT. Um, so it, there's, a, there's no wrong answers. It's just a question of um, seeing, seeing what's uh, uh, available. Um, the kind of thing with radiographs though is taking good quality radiographs. You'll notice on this one, it was sort of sent, sent in as a, a cranial caudal view of the elbow. Um, and really on this, you can't really say anything. So if you are taking radiographs, do make sure that you're taking um, at least two views in terms of a, a true lateral and a true quarter cranial, because with this, we'll know if this is kind of x-rays that you're managing to get, no, it's not worthwhile. Um, it's not diagnostic and you're gonna miss things, absolutely. 
Um, this dog, for example, actually had a humeral, in, in, humeral intercondylar fissure, which in this particular dog was quite um, easily detected on a cord cranial film. Um, you can see a really nice fissure. Now, they're not always nearly that obvious, and sometimes it can be really hard to see on x-ray. But sometimes you can see the problem and get to the, to the diagnosis quite easily. So a lot of the time, though, we can take x-rays and we can take x-rays of the whole leg and we can see absolutely nothing. Maybe if we, um, we've done some survey radiographs, we've radiographed the carpus and the elbow um, and the humerus and all of that sort of thing. We haven't found anything. Well, what do we do then? Um, you know, you've booked that dog in for uh, the, those x-rays and you're looking at the x-rays and I'm not seeing anything. Well, what do I do now? Well, what I'd say in that scenario is, is go back to my cheats guide to orthopedics and consider um, the elbows most likely. Again, as long as you know your physical examination can, is consistent with there not being anywhere else that's sore or painful, if either that's consistent with the elbows being sore or you're not really finding anything, you're not really sure, again, elbows are much most, most likely to be the issue. We can probably go one step further than that in our cheats guide um, as it's most likely elbow dysplasia until proven otherwise. So the next thing I want to, to ask you all um, is uh, how do you guys um, treat um, presumed elbow dysplasia? This is where I'm now trying to uh, get another poll for us. So um, let's la launch that and, and see what everyone's doing. Um, how, how are you treating um, elbow dysplasia and one of the reasons i'm asking the question is i guess since opening nibs um i haven't really seen um that many cases of elbow dysplasia which i found um a bit surprising um given where we worked where i was working previously there was uh, it was probably sort of one of the sort of big bread and butter cases of, of the cases that we saw so i found it a little bit unusual and that's sort of one of the reasons i'd be interested to see um what what people are doing um, so we've got uh, pretty good um, response rates there. We'll just sort of share those um, results. Um, so a lot of people um, doing rest and non-steroidals, which is, which is great. A um, few people go straight for arthroscopy. A um, uh, small number will refer, and, uh, and that's a sort of fairly um, normal um, sort of overview of, of, of what's there. And I said there's, there's, there's no wrong wrong answers there we're just here to sort of see what um, people are doing so just quickly have a look at the, the brief sort of idea of, of elbow anatomy um, so we get our heads around to it so the um, upper arm bone is uh, the humerus and that interchanges with the um, the radius and the ulna now you know the elbow is quite a complex joint it's it's not like a the the ball and socket joint of the of the hip what we've got here is a, is a hinge joint. Um, and as a result of that, it's a lot more complex to, to image. Um, and uh, it's a lot more complex as a mechanical structure. It's also a lot more complex in dogs than it is in humans because it's a weight bearing joint. Points of interest of the anconeal process, uh, which at the back of the olecranon here, and the coronoid process, uh, which is on the medial side of the joint, um, which is the, uh, the distal um, articular portion um, of the ulna. Now, elbow dysplasia is pretty common in Labrador retrievers, Bernese Mountain um, dogs, uh, Rottweilers, Golden Retrievers, and it's due to sort of the, the abnormal development of the elbow joint. It's due to poor fit, essentially, of the humerus the radius and the ulna. And that poor fit can lead to areas of abnormally high contact pressure, which then lead to cartilage wear and ultimately arthritis in the long term. Um, whilst most often we'll see signs of progressive sort of thoracic limb lameness from around four and a half, five months of age, um, elbow dysplasia can actually present at any age um, without any previous symptoms. So, you know, if you've got a seven year old dog that comes in that's got a thoracic limb lameness, of, you know, it's just been going on last since last week. Could it be elbow dysplasia? Yes, absolutely. It still could be. Um, and also we can see it unilaterally or bilaterally. It's not, you know, just because a dog has elbow dysplasia on one side doesn't necessarily mean the other side is going to have um, elbow dysplasia. So we can see it unilaterally, bilaterally, whatever, on varying different degrees. 
Now, there are various different forms of what falls into the, the concept of elbow dysplasia. Um, OCD or osteochondritis desiccans is often reported as one of those, and it's, it's usually seen on the um, medial humeral condyle in the elbow. Um, but OCD isn't just isolated to the elbow. It can be seen in other joints, the uh, shoulder, stifle, hock, and is, it's probably better considered slightly separately as it's really a disorder of endochondral ossification. And whilst the etiology isn't completely understood, it, it's thought to be caused by uh, the interruption of the blood supply to small areas of cartilage and bone during their development, which can later lead to um, flat formation, which is where osteochondrosis becomes osteochondrosis desiccans, which is the desiccated area of cartilage, which sort of dies off, becomes a flap, and um, ultimately can lead to um, defects in the articular surface um, which we can see in the joint. And it tends to um, occur in the sort of medial humeral condyle um, in, in the elbow. Ununited ankyneal process is, it also falls under the sort of umbrella term of um, elbow dysplasia. Um, and uh, it may also actually be another form of osteochondrosis, this time at the, the growth plate um, between the, um, sorry, I seem to have um, skipped through a bit. Um, this time is at the growth plate between the ankyneus um, and the olecranon here. Alternatively, it's possible that it might be caused by sort of a normal pressure on the ankyneal process from um, humor and ulna um, incongruity. Medial coronoid process disease, however, is probably the most common manifestation of elbow dysplasia that we see. And that's really what I want to concentrate on um, tonight. Um, you'll know I haven't put a nice obvious radiograph up on this slide um, like I have on, on the previous ones. Um, and part of the reason for that um, is because sometimes it can be really hard to see it on an x-ray, but we'll come back to that um, in a moment. What I want to concentrate really on is a very simplistic way is, is how and why we see medial coronary process disease develop. Um, now, obviously this is a very simplistic diagram, humerus, ulna here, um, and radius here. If I just move the humerus out of the way for a moment, um, we can see the red surface um, of the, the arctic, which is basically the articular surface. Um, and the pathology of elbow dysplasia um, sort of arises from abnormal weight bearing uh, occurring uh, across um, the joint. Weight has to be transferred from the humerus down um, onto the ulna and the radius. And usually the medial coronoid process of the ulna and the radial head here share the weight around about 49, 51%. Um, it's just fairly even across the two of them. Now, I'm gonna exaggerate this from a completely simple, uh, simplified issue. So if during the growing process of the elbow, the radius, for example, is very slightly shorter. In this scenario, when the humerus interacts then with this joint, uh, the medial coronoid process here is High, at a higher point, therefore, uh, to, the, to the radial head, and as such, um, has a higher concentration of forces on than it was necessarily designed to do. Um, and as a result, we can see micro stress fractures uh, within that um, process developing, which can result in, in pain and lameness. Um, and ultimately, these little um, loose fragments here can be a little bit like having a stone uh, in a shoe that doesn't fit you very well. Um, whilst the shoe still doesn't fit you very well, that stone um, adds some extra degree of discomfort to you walking around in it. Now, medial compartment syndrome is probably the next sort of step, the next evolution of medial coronary process disease. They're quite closely linked. Potentially it's where medial coronary process disease is that initial um, medial side of the joint is, is getting more worn out and we can see um, sort of small fissures and fracturing. But if that were to progress further, what we can see is um, the inside portion of the joint, that medial portion of the joint, um, the cartilage there wearing out. If we get this sort of progressive cartilage wear, and this is an arthroscopic image um, where we've got pink denuded bone now, no cartilage, there's cartilage here on the lateral aspect of the joint, on the medial side of the joint, we've just got bone on bone contact. Um, so these are the two parts of elbow dysplasia, really that I guess are the, the more common that we see, um, and that's what we're um, gonna concentrate on. Um, now, radiographically, you know, things actually can be quite useful to detecting um, medial coronary process disease, but it, it's not as, not as obvious, and some of the signs can be quite subtle. Um, and therefore can be quite easily missed. 
Um, so some of the things really to look for when you're looking at your um, radiographs um, is, is this area here. Um, and as we look at the medullary um, cavity of the ulna, we'll notice it narrowing at this point here, and we can see an increased um, density in the bone. And this is sort of known as subtrocular sclerosis. And that is a key sort of indicator that we've got sort of, I guess, scarring formation happening at this area of the bone underneath the anconeal process as a result of that abnormal weight bearing. So that's one of the key indicators that we can see. Sometimes we can also see uh, either changes in the density of the medial coronoid process, which is just here on the radiograph, um, but it is sort of covered up by the head of the radius. So it can be quite difficult. Other sort of signs that we can see would be mild signs of sort of osteoarthritis um, around the joint. And remember, osteoarthritis on its own isn't a primary um, disease. Our elbow dysplasia really is the is the is the primary disease, and it's that's what we want to look at um, uh, treating. CT, however, is much much more sensitive and is really sort of essential in the management and, and diagnosis of, of elbow dysplasia. Um, arthroscopy is very much used for um, uh, sort of therapeutic management only. It's not really a diagnostic tool per se. It's really only ever used um, if you feel that there's a therapeutic benefit to doing so. And actually getting to that decision um, is probably a balance of um, history taking, um, clinical examination, um, what's already been done, and also the CT. Now you can see in the CT here, this is the, the humerus, this is a um, sagittal view of the ulna, and we can see a fairly obvious uh, chip through the, uh, or fragmentation of the medial coronoid process. Um, and uh, on this view here, again, this is the radius here, this is the ulna, and there's a little chip here, little fragment. Now, it's not always that obvious, it's always a little bit more like this. Um, and again, this is the medial coronoid process here and the radial head. We can just about make out um, a little fissure through there. Sometimes it's even a little bit more subtle than that with regards to just a small change in density. And that's probably um, more of a change in us being able to pick up this sort of disease earlier and recognize those changes and work out some of the things that we can do for them. Now, there was an interesting paper um, that came out in 2011 that looked at how do we treat um, uh, you know, medial coronoid process disease in dogs. And it asked the question, you know, conservative versus arthroscopic management. Um, and it came out with a rather controversial uh, thought that actually there's no difference between conservative versus arthroscopic management for, for this disease. But there was one major flaw with, with the paper in that, that it treated every dog the same. And the problem that we have is that dogs with elbow dysplasia are not the same. There is no one strict algorithm. We haven't really, we don't know enough about elbows. The more you know about elbows, you realize the less you know about elbows. Um, and there's such a degree of, of severity that it's really difficult for us to actually classify elbow dysplasia. And it's very hard to put these um, dogs into the same bracket. And whilst we've got this sort of single word elbow dysplasia, or even more specifically medial coronoid process disease, there's a lot of problems that really kind of fit in with this. And it's a sliding scale, I suppose. So for an example, um, on the left here, we've got an arthroscopic image inside the elbow. We've got the humerus up here. We've got the radius um, in the far corner there. And then this is the ulna. And we can see the cartilage in this joint is pretty normal, um, very nice, healthy looking, smooth white cartilage. Um, and we've got a little crack through here. So this is a, a, a fairly nice fragmented medial coronoid process um, with a loose, sort of small loose fragment in the elbow. And the prognosis for, for this joint is actually pretty good, um, particularly with surgery. Um, if we were to look to, to remove this small area, this, I guess, that idea of a stone in a shoe sort of scenario, um, that dog's likely to do quite well. Um, on this side, um, we've got complete loss of the cartilage on the inside portion of the joint, severe, severe diffuse cartilage wear. Um, and the prognosis for that dog is very, very different because it's, you know, we haven't got a way necessarily of replacing that cartilage. Um, so there's a vast um, difference in what we can see. Now, a lot of dogs that we see, if we see them early, um, uh, we, we can see them more at this sort of stage where they've got um, uh, actually quite a focal disease, quite nice looking cartilage. Um, and the, the best way to sort of treat these cases is again, 
if you've got a stone in your shoe, even if your shoe doesn't fit you very well, removing that stone makes you feel a lot more comfortable and you can walk a lot further and you don't need medication and it makes your life a lot easier. And that's really what we're looking to do with this. Um, and this is a little video um, of what we're looking. So um, the treatment really what we'd use is a subtotal coronadectomy, but aim to remove the, the small um, piece of uh, fissured cartilage plus an, a slightly area of, of normal air of bone and cartilage just to try and um, get any other sort of uh, extra uh, fissures uh, in that region of bone. Um, the procedure itself is fairly quick. This is a little sort of time-lapse video and often we'll actually find that the setup for arthroscopy often takes um, slightly longer setting up than it actually does um, to do the surgery. Um, it's keyhole surgery, so it's just done through, you know, tiny little millimeter um, things. The, the key things is that the, uh, most dogs really will improve. Um, some dogs, not all, but some will improve completely, which is fantastic. Um, and it's a pretty relatively low risk and fast recovery. And in terms of giving your owners an idea of, of what it costs, um, you know, if you were to come down and, and send the case over to us, uh, consultation is of roughly 150 pounds. Um, Usually we'd recommend a CT, it'd be roughly sort of 1,000, 1,200 pounds. Um, and if they were to go ahead with, with arthroscopy, um, looking up to sort of two and a half thousand pounds, that just gives you an idea of what it might cost if you were um, to sort of send these cases over to us. Um, diffuse pathology or sort of medial compartment syndrome is a little bit more complicated um, because where you've lost um, the cartilage, it's a bit more difficult to, to manage. Um, it's also not something uh, that you can actually diagnose without arthroscopic evaluation. So you really need to sort of stick an arthroscope in, in this elbow to actually see what's going on. That'll help with making those decisions. Now, just because we've got sort of poor cartilage doesn't actually mean we, we can get bad results. Doesn't mean that's the dog's written off. Um, there's definitely some options that we've got for us. The first question, I suppose, what we want to ask, ask is, is, is why even intervene in the first place? There are various different elbow replacement systems out there, um, but the results really can be quite unpredictable. This is a video of a dog 10 months um, post-surgery. Um, this isn't one of my cases. I, I will give credit to, to YouTube for, for, for this one. Um, but the end sort of stage options for, for, for elbow dysplasia aren't that great. Now, if we compare that to the outcome post a total hip replacement, it's quite stark. Um, this was a top level agility dog 10 months after total hip replacement back in full training and competition. So anything we can do to avoid getting to this sort of stage with the elbows where we might even consider total elbow replacement. Um, so anything we can do to reduce that speed of osteoarthritis, the better. And we have got a couple of options. Um, proximal ulnar osteotomy um, has been used um, to uh, make a, a cut in the ulna here that essentially allows offloading of the uh, medial joint compartment and improve the congruency um, of the jaw uh, of the elbow and uh, can be quite quite handy in some cases um, for slightly older dogs um, I say probably proximal and obviously for slightly younger dogs but slightly older dogs we might use something like uh, the pool surgery which uh, it's called the proximal abducting ulna osteotomy. It's a slightly odd surgery. It again involves cutting the ulna um, and is uh, uh, designed to uh, essentially change the biomechanics of the limb such that the dog puts uh, its, its leg and its foot in a slightly different position that again, ultimately offloads um, the medial joint compartment. Um, slightly humeral osteotomy is also being described, but it's a much bigger approach. Um, so if we've got other options that uh, aren't quite as, as, as invasive as that, these are quite nice. The prognosis for diffuse pathology, though, is not quite as good, but it's still better than doing nothing. Um, the improvement is a bit slower and it's incomplete in, in most. Um, and yeah, there are a few dogs that don't improve. But for the most part, it you know, it's something that um, for the right dog, it can make a significant um, uh, benefit. Um, there are sort of, again, slightly more risk with uh, any sort of surgeries. So slightly slower healing and problems with mechanical bone failure or infection. 
where we don't do things like surgery, there are other sort of options that we can consider and anything from an intra-articular therapy such as platelet-rich plasma, hyaluronic acid, stem cell therapy, for example. For some dogs, right selection of these can make a significant difference. The other thing I want to sort of roughly touch on is the older dog that we've known had elbow arthritis, most likely due to elbow dysplasia for many years, is those dogs that can acutely deteriorate. Um, and there's a few things that are worth mentioning on that. The first one is septic arthritis, which is pretty common. Um, but if you, I guess if you've ruled out septic arthritis in a dog that you know got sort of arthritis there, and you're wondering why it's suddenly acutely deteriorated, one of the things that can be worthwhile considering as to whether actually, particularly if it's sudden, we've got sudden inflammation, is something called the ancaneal osteophyte. And this is something where we get marked osteo um, osteophytosis in a joint. Um, and then sometimes a, a big osteophyte at the back of the ancaneus here can suddenly crack off and then suddenly start causing problems in the elbow. And even in the face of really marked arthritis, for these cases, sometimes actually just... Um, removing uh, that uh, ancaneal osteophyte, um, as you can see here, can make a dramatic difference to how those dogs do. One of the other things I wanted to touch on as well is this, which is quite an exciting new development um, in, in elbow um, dis dysplasia management. Um, and it's, uh, it's a sort of treatment option for dogs, I guess, with the most severe form of, of medial compartment disease. Um, the surgery essentially involves partially resurfacing the elbow joint by placing a, a mesh titanium um, implant into the base of the humerus and another uh, into the ulna. Essentially sort of forces the, the elbow apart a little bit, provides a new um, partial joint resurfacing um, area um, and, and actually has some pretty good um, results. It is a pretty major operation. I did say elbows, knees and woes was the title of this talk um, and I suppose this is one of those woe photos. Uh, it does require quite an extensive approach. Um, really have to sort of open up the elbow completely in order to get in there. But you can see the implants um, in here. This is the humeral side and the, the ulnar side. Um, again, if you get a major complication, you know, it, it, it's, it's, uh, it's challenging um, to deal with. You may end up salvage surgery options. But where it works um, is probably slightly better than total elbow replacement it's it's got much sort of um, better and faster rates of improvement um, and is significantly lower risk than something like the total elbow replacement um, on average it takes around about six months for them to reach peak function but the and the rate of magnitude of improvement may vary between individuals but um, probably around about 80 percent of dogs uh, operated on by, by the queue will experience a long-term improvement in lameness exercise tolerance comfort um, it's not a complete cure, um, but it's an exciting new development and something that I've had some really good success with. And it's definitely something worth considering for those um, more uh, severely affected dogs. So moving on to the second half of the, the, the talk, really want to, to look at uh, knees. Um, and uh, again, going back to this uh, cheats guide to orthopedics, um, essentially, if you've got a dog with a pelvic limb lameness, Again, if a physical examination doesn't reveal anything else, consider the knees um, are most likely. Um, and again, one step further, it's probably going to be a cruciate. Um, again, unless it's a sight hound, in which case, uh, you know, it's probably a corn or a sesamoid disease. Um, but it's just a nice sort of vague rule of thumb. What should I be thinking about? Pelvic limb lameness in dogs, it's probably a cruciate. And one of the things that we can actually do is sometimes we can diagnose that um, just by looking at a dog in the consult room or in the waiting room before we've even invited them in. The normal adult dog will sit like this with nice and square. Puppies are a bit different. They sit with their one leg tucked underneath them. But if you've got an adult dog that sits like a puppy, actually that can be an indication that this dependent leg here um, is a bit sore. Um, and often you'll see if dogs are sitting like this, that actually they might have um, a cruciate ligament deficiency. My most valuable diagnostic test for knee problems is actually thorough physical examination. And um, much like when we're talking with the elbows, looking at the, the knees is again a question of comparing left and right, looking at both together, starting with the normal side, having a feel down the legs, feel down the, the muscle mass. Also putting that um, leg through full range of motion, inflection and extension. Um, pausing and extension, which will sort of stretch the cruciate ligament. Is there any sort of clunking, pressing on the sort of medial aspect of the joint, medial aspect of the femur um, and the tibia? 
Um, how's the patella tracking? Does that track normally in the trochlear groove? Rotating the uh, hock um, internally and externally, see if it stays in place. And then also functional tests at the cranial draw and cranial tibial thrust, which I'll come back to in a minute. Physical exam findings specific really to um, cranial cruciate ligament um, rupture, we might see signs of quadriceps atrophy and joint effusion. So you should be able to, to place your sort of thumb and forefinger either side of the patella ligament in the dog. Um, if you're not sure about what you're feeling, compare it to the other side. And if you can't feel the patella ligament, that joint's probably effused. Um, and again, if you've got an effusion, most likely, um, the dog's going to have um, a, a cruciate ligament rupture. The other sort of tell side thing that we can get is medial joint thickening or medial buttress. And again, compare the left to the right. If you've got one knee that's much thicker on the inside than the other side, again, it's probably quite a telltale indicator this dog's got a cruciate ligament rupture. And this is before we've even done any of the, uh, the more specific tests. Um, Partial um, cranial cruciate ligament ruptures often respond by showing pain on extension of the leg as you're stretching the ligament. You might see crepitus, it's not that common, but you might. And you might occasionally get a bit of a um, meniscal click as well. Um, so again, retrographs are often the next sort of stage, but if you've got to the point of not having a, an idea of, of what um, what is what dog is, you know, lame on, you book that dog in for x-rays and you say, well, I'm not really sure where the, 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 the dog is lame. So we can take some x-rays of, of the hind legs and see what we find. Um, and imagine then um, this is, um, you know, what we've got on, the, on our x-rays. Um, so what I'd like to do is if I can just, uh, just do another little um, poll just to see one you're still listening uh and two what do you think so we've got some uh, spondylitis we've got some hip dysplasia with uh, it's fairly bad hip dysplasia to be fair with some arthritis there and we've got some stifle effusion and some some osteophytes and the question is you know what what how, what do we do with that we've got three problems now um and um how do we you know how are we going to respond to that what's what's important again no wrong answers i can't see who's voting um so don't be afraid, just put in what you'd say. Um, and and this, this is a key sort of thing. It's quite a common thing that we will we, we'll see is that what, what's the most significant finding? Um, okay, we still got a few votes coming in there, which is good. Good stuff, right, okay, we'll just, uh, all right, a few more, okay. Okay, we'll just end that there um, and uh, share those results with you. So, yeah, pretty, pretty, almost sort of even between hip dysplasia and, and the the stifle effusion. Um, and the key thing that I probably would 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 say on this is um, that I would actually um, uh, agree with the majority of you there um, that the stifle effusion um, is the most. Um, significant finding spondylosis rarely is um on its own you know it, it, it rarely ever sort of causes a problem and yes this dog's got quite a significant hip dysplasia so we can't deny that and that may well be an issue for this dog and maybe it needs some 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 problems but um if we go back to our guide our cheats guide and think it's um knees unless it's anything you know until proven otherwise that probably still um plays for these x-rays as well um and one of the things that uh, we know is that chronic knee problems um, can trigger uh, other issues, whether it be chronic um, back pain or uh, hip issues, can be much worse um, if we've got a chronic um, knee issue. And if we target the primary problem, in this instance, the cruciate ligament rupture or the, this uh, stifle effusion, um, that will often improve the secondary problems, which in this case may well be the um, hip dysplasia and arthritis so we have to treat the dog and not the x-ray uh, i have to remember that and some dogs can have really bad looking hips and actually do great with them so the key is to treat the primary problem and then see what's going on with everything else so just again remember that cheats guide stifles the knees they're the most appropriate some of the things that we can see on radiographs um the key thing to remember is that radiographs are not a diagnosis of uh, cranial cruciate ligament rupture um uh, the rule out a few things uh, they'll rule out um you haven't got a tumor obviously the tumor uh, uh, you know we know that um 
some uh, bone tumors will I think, away from the elbow towards the knee. So that's one thing we you know, want to rule out. Um, we want to see that are there signs that are consistent with cruciate ligament disease, but um, it doesn't actually give you the diagnosis. Looking at the x-ray, we can say, yes, it's consistent with cruciate ligament disease. But it doesn't actually say this. The diagnosis really comes from palpation. Some of the things that we can see that we're looking for um, would be a cranial pap fat pad um, uh, loss of uh, visibility of that so joint effusion here effacement of that fat pad um, we can also see um, caudal joint capsule extension often there's a sort of fascial plane back here which gets distorted um, osteophyte formation around the fabella um, and uh, around the rest of the joint really um, some dogs also we can see a mineralization of the uh, the cranial band of the uh, cranial cruciate ligament down here as well. That can be another sort of telltale sign. Um, so those are the sorts of things that we're we're really um, uh, looking for. So actually, sort of diagnosis really comes down to um, the sort of dynamic tests, and that's really how we we, we can we can tell. Um, yes, there's a, a cruciate ligament insufficiency there. And the best way of doing this um, is to place um, your, sort of your thumb, say, behind um, the fabella of the femur and your forefinger just on top of the um, top of the femur, top of the, the, the patella here. And then your other hand, um, you want one sort of finger um, behind the uh, tibia and another in front of it. And then you're just sort of moving them um, in respect of each other and like you see in, in the video here if you've got a dog that's got a really unstable knee it might already be in the cranially subluxated position so sometimes you actually need to pull the tibia backwards in order to actually tell you've got cranial displacement so don't be caught out with that also try it in different positions um, try it in, a, in extension in flexion in somewhere in between and just try it in a few different um, areas if you're not used to doing it do it on a normal dog you've got in for a spay or something like that and just feel loads of knees the other test that could be quite useful is the tibial compression test um, the beauty of the tibial compression test is it mimics the loading that causes craniotibial thrust um, when the dog walks and the best way of doing this is to put um, your again thumb behind the back of the femur and your finger, for me, I prefer the finger actually to go um, right over the top of the fabella and down onto the uh, tibial tuberosity. And then with your other hand to essentially flex um, the, the hock. And as you essentially do that, you're mimicking weight transfer. And, and if the cruciate ligament is, um, uh, is broken, what you'll see is that um, cranial subluxation of the tibial tuberosity, you'll notice your forefinger basically, which should be pretty stable, um, moves forward and you'll feel that underneath your finger. And that will obviously you know, change the level of instability that you'll feel given the type of cruciate in ligament injury that we've got. And in dogs, it's not like in humans, um, we, you know, cruciate ligament injury is a degenerative condition. The ligament itself gets weaker over a period of time um, rather than often just an acute failure. Now, whilst often we'll see dogs present with an acute issue, it's usually due to a, um, a degenerative cause underneath it. When we look at the actual ligaments themselves, they are, they're, they're quite sort of degenerate or, already. So we can see basically partial cruciate ligament failures. And with that, um, there's a small amount of, of, uh, of cranial tibial thrust or cranial draw that you can feel. When you have a more complete rupture, um, you'll notice it's much more obvious to detect. So it's, it's not easy, particularly if you've got a partial rupture. Um, partial rupture will often at some point go towards a complete rupture. The other thing to notice here is the meniscus, which is that shock absorber between the femur um, and the tibia. Um, and you can see it highlighted in yellow is because we can see essentially more meniscal problems um, and therefore sort of more lameness on presentation with a more complete rupture. And just to touch on that, um, risk factors for meniscal tears. We do see meniscal tears in association with cruciate ligament um, problems. Um, we can see various different types. Um, this is a normal cruciate. Um, this is a vertical um, longitudinal tear, which is through here. This is a classic sort of bucket handle tear. You can see this is the normal side, um, the bucket handle tear, and flap tear. You can see various radial tears. You can also see sometimes see horizontal tears. They're really challenging to, to actually diagnose. Um, then various sort of uh, complex tears and degenerative tears where basically it just kind of gets completely worn away. A um, couple of interesting sort of 
um, facts about um, meniscal tears is they're nearly 13 times more likely if you've got complete rupture. Um, and they're also a lot more likely the longer the lameness um, has been going on and the fat of the dog is. Um, so that's just a few interesting um, points. So the next sort of poll um, that be interested to, oh, I didn't realize I've been sharing that for so long. Um, sorry about that, if that's been in your way. Um, what I wanted to uh, see is how you guys were treating your, your cruciate ligament injuries. So let's, let's see what everyone's doing. Um, there's something else. Um, that's great. Um, it's just sort of always interesting to hear what everyone's doing because there's so many um, different uh, techniques out there um, and there's so much sort of misinformation um, as, as well. Okay. So we've got a fairly interesting sort of mix of things. Oh, that's great. So I'll just end that and share the results. I'll try and remember to uh, uh, remove those out of the way. So um, <clears throat> the sort of interesting mix there, sort of roughly sort of 20% of people with TPLO, 20% sort of TTA, ran just slightly more with extra capsular suture, a few people referring, a few people with conservative management, um, the odd sort of tightrope and an MMP. Um, and I guess these are the, the various different te techniques that we've got um, here. Um, this is the, the TPLO. Uh, this is a, an MMP, which is a modified MACA procedure, involves making this little um, hole um, down here. This is a TTA rapid. This is the original Securos TTA. This is a extra capsular suture, although um, modern um, ways probably wouldn't put the, uh, the hole down here, but probably more so in this area. And this is a tightrope, which is, I guess, a form of extra capsular suture, um, but just using a particular um, multi-filament um, ligament. Um, now at NIVS, um, we perform um, TPLO um, and uh, how it works is it basically it takes the concept of um, the of this, uh, the end of the femur basically being sort of a, a bottom shape. And that sits on the top of the tibia, known as a tibial plateau, um, which in most dogs has a rough sort of I don't know, 25 degree um, slope to it. So it much like you take your kid to the park, you stick them on top of a slide, that bum falls down the back of the slide. Um, and uh, the body therefore has a, a seat belt um, in place. Um, the cranial cruciate ligament runs from the back of the femur here to the front of the tibia here. And essentially that straps that bottom in at the top of the hill. Um, and uh, when that ligament breaks, um, obviously this femur can roll down the, the hill um, down the back here. Um, and the TPLO works in the concept that um, I'm not falling off my seat currently because my seat is flat. And if therefore we can put this bottom on a flat surface, then it too doesn't need a seat belt um, to stay in place. So the way it works is it sort of works out where the center of rotation of the joint is and then takes a circular saw, a radial saw even, that makes a cut in this bone here and rotates the top of that piece of bone such that essentially um, the tibial plateau is um, flat in relation to the weight bearing axis of the joint, um, which means that we don't get any further um, tibial thrust, the joint is stable, and then this piece of bone is stabilized with a, with a metal plate and screw. The real question is, often we're asked is, why do we do TPLO over anything else? And there's a wealth of misinformation um, about that. So I'll just look at a few key points um, in regards to that. There was this publication here um, that came with it surveyed a lot of um, orthopedic surgeons and there seemed to be this overwhelming preference for TPLO over TTA with 71% um, of, of surgeons um, recommending uh, TPLO. So we, I guess we need to ask ourselves, you know, why, why that is. And some of the reason for that is it's supported by a growing number of publications um, in the, the veterinary literature, which present fairly objective evidence of superior results for TPLO over some of the um, other techniques that are out there. 
This was a, a randomized blinded controlled clinical trial with dogs randomly assigned to undergo lateral favela suture or TPLO with force placed analysis, uh, looking at peak vertical force of the affected limbs um, at the walk and trot um, three, six, 12 months after surgery. Um, one of the things that they noticed was that the kinematic and owner satisfaction results indicated the dogs that underwent TPLO had a better outcome than those that underwent lateral favela suture. This was um, uh, another study looking at uh, um, MMP against tibial plateau leveling osteotomy or TPLO. And again, tibial plateau leveling osteotomy, osteotomy patients showed superior superiority with regard to clinical outcome. Further to that, there were some comparisons of long-term outcomes associated with um, three techniques, a TPLO, um, the tightrope, which is this one here, um, and the TTA. Um, and interestingly, the TPLO and the tightrope, again, showed superiority over the TTA in terms of dogs achieving full function. The highest levels of frequency and severity of pain in TTA cases. Um, and TTA was associated with the most complications, including the highest rates of major complications and meniscal tears. Interestingly, this paper was actually written by the man um, that designed and gets royalties for the tightrope. So there was some degree of bias for why this one did particularly well, potentially. Um, again, another study, um, 118 dogs um, that uh, looked at um, a comparison between TTA, extracapsular suture and TPLO. Um, and of the three, arthritis progressed more after TTA. Um, dogs with um, TPLO seem to have less pain and fewer mobility issues um, with um, better um, jumping, climbing, less limping during mild activities, um, less pain, uh, less interference with walking and overall a better quality of life. And they concluded that the TPLO provides a better long-term radiographic and functional outcome um, than the TTA. And there was this paper, um, which also looked at uh, TTA versus TPLO and extra capsular repair. Um, again, there's another force place analysis study um, looking at dogs uh, eight weeks, six months, 12 months after surgery. Um, and at the walk, um, both the TTA and the TP TPLL group um, achieved normal function. The extra capsular group um, did not. Um, but the trot, the TPLO group, was the only surgical group to achieve normal function. I don't know about you, but my dog spends most of her time trotting um, when she's out on a walk. And so to me, actually, that is probably quite important. And the TTA and the extra capsular um, repair groups didn't. And one of the interesting sort of points that they had to make at the end of their conclusions, looking at the three techniques side by side, was that TPLO is a more appropriate recommendation for active patients, if not all patients, considering an osteotomy procedure, which is a pretty major thing. Um, one of the other things that we can see with uh, TTA uh, is some pretty nasty complications, which can be quite challenging to treat. Um, the other thing is that I'm often asked is, you know, TPLO, I thought that was just for big dogs. Um, well, actually, that's not the case. Um, you can do anything from your two kilo chihuahua um, to Great Danes. Um, sometimes actually some of the other sutures, or some of the other techniques, uh, even the TTA, um, you've got a, a maximum a cage width of say 12 millimeters. Some of those bigger dogs, actually, you're not going to get um, the ability to do that uh, with. So um, the TPLO actually over some of the other techniques has the ability to do essentially any size dog. Um, this was a dog that I had in recently, uh, it was a 2.6 kilo um, Chihuahua, um, which had a uh, lateral fabella suture um, performed, but that unfortunately it failed and we had persistent instability. Um, and uh, we ended up having to uh, repair that. It also had medial patellar luxation as well, which is what is going on here with a uh, combined tibial tuberosity um, transposition as well as the um, uh, TPLO. Other things worth working about talking about is excessive tibial um, plateau slopes. Um, and uh, Westies are, are quite well known for having really quite steep um, uh, tibial plateaus in relation to the long axis of the tibia. Um, and we know that TTA, for example, is not advisable if you've got a tibial plateau angle of anything over sort of 25 to, to 30 degrees. Um, and uh, partly the reason for that is you just can't get the tibial um, uh, tuberosity 
far enough advanced with any of the cages to actually get any level of stability. Um, and sometimes in that scenario, and this is again, a, a, an MMP surgery um, that was performed and again, the same sort of issue um, for this particular surgery. Um, and uh, uh, it, you know, it, it wasn't able to sort of bring this forward enough. And we ended up having to try and revise this um, with a, with a TPLO, which is a little bit more um, complicated. This was a, uh, another case in um, that had had a, 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 a TTA done um, for uh, concurrent um, cruciate ligament rupture and medial patella luxation. Um, but the problem with this particular um, surgery um, was that uh, the tibial um, uh, tuberosity advancement actually pulled the patella out of the groove and made the patella luxation worse. Um, and uh, actually there's still, despite um, a, a pretty good sort of angle between the patella tendon and the tibial plateau, there was still stifle instability. So we had to sort of revise this by taking everything out, doing a TPLO and bringing the, the tibial um, uh, tuberosity back into position to hold this and improve the uh, groove situation there. Um, tibial um, uh, plateau level can also be really useful um, when we're looking at angular and torsional um, tibial deformity, um, uh, as the TPLO uh, involves an osteotomy that isolates the proximal articular surface from the distal surface of the hoc, um, meaning that if you've got um, a deformity of the tibia, tibia, you can actually use a TPLO jig to correct that during surgery, um, rather than having to do any extra sort of cuts. It's a really nice way of actually getting dog's legs straighter if they've got some angular um, torsional tibial deformity that's playing into some of the um, uh, instability that's already there. Um, one last thing is there is the highly stable knee. So certainly it's a slightly controversial sort of thing. It's not really widely reported, but certainly we've seen a few sort of boxes um, that seem to suffer from what is sort of stable um, cranial cruciate ligament disease where the stifle feels very, very stable, um, but the, um, there seems to be some issues with um, the, the stability that's there. And often these dogs actually can respond quite nicely to TPLO as the rotation um, will sort of de to de um, take basically takes the strain off the cranial cruciate ligament and that can improve the lameness um, in those dogs. So after talking about that, I thought it would be worthwhile actually showing well how well do these dogs actually do um, uh, after surgery. Um, so these are a, a, a few cases um, that essentially these are sort of one day um, after surgery. Um, and this is, I guess, what we'd expect to see. Um, and it's one of the reasons that um, we you know, think that the, the surgery works very well um, uh, is that these are the sorts of results um, that we can do. Um, and that is not isolated to just four-legged dogs. Um, this is a, 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 a tripod um, that uh, again presented with a, uh, a cruciate ligament rupture uh, that uh, we did a TPLO on and actually was doing very well. This is um, the same dog about six weeks later um, and this made a significant difference to this dog's quality of life. Um, so that shouldn't be a prerequisite to um, uh, not doing surgery, we can um, do these things in in in, in all sorts of um, cases. Again, um, at NIBS, uh, just rough sort of estimate of cost. If you're not sure where dogs lane, um, send it to us, and we'll have a little look for you. Um, more than happy to help with that sort of thing. Um, consultations around about 150 pounds, um, and we offer sort of fixed priced um, TPLOs. Um, uh, there's some price list there, just as a rough guide in terms of. Um, giving your owners uh, an idea of, of, of what to expect. Um, so the key points really um, was uh, if you've got a dog with thoracic limb lameness, it's probably elbow dysplasia unless you found anything else. Um, and there are plenty of treatment options, um, even if they're young dogs, old dogs, dogs with marked osteoarthritis, dogs with nothing on the x-rays. Um, there are definitely options that can make them um, better. Surgery is not always the answer, um, but Sometimes it is, and it can make a significant difference. And if you've got a dog with a pelvic limb lameness, um, consider it's probably the cruciate, unless you found anything else on clinical examination. And remember that there's an interesting um, volume of evidence, ever growing volume of evidence that seems to suggest um, that TPLO um, does have superior outcomes. Um, and the last point is that NIVS is here to help. Um, if you ever want to talk about cases, ever want to um, 
you know, send in x-rays or videos, we're more than happy to chat to you and, uh, and, and here to help. So uh, thanks for listening. Um, if you've got any questions, um, you can always email on uh, the uh, thing here uh, and indeed um, give us a call. So thanks for listening. Uh, so I think there might be a few questions there. Uh, got Rory, uh, who has asked, um, do you think TPLOs are more successful because they're more commonly done by specialists or were the studies comparing the TPLOs, TTA and uh, extracapsular rupture all done by specialists? Um, I think that's an interesting um, theory. I think um, that the, the TPLO is a more challenging surgery than some of the others. Um, it is a surgery that when I was learning it and who I was taught by was said it's a, it's a bit like a shark. Um, it will bite you if you get it wrong. Um, so I think it is a surgery that is probably, um, I guess, better done by people that, that are, I guess, doing, doing it a lot, um, if that makes sense. Um, the, so I think it's a challenging question, I think, and we don't know enough. And there are some interesting things developing um, with the, the RCVS knowledge, looking at uh, more information on uh, outcomes of cranial cruciate ligament rupture, which hopefully we'll see in the next couple of years. So that's something to, to watch and hopefully we'll get some of those answers. So hopefully that answers that. Um, <clears throat> we've got another one from Steve. What do you think about the VETLIG system? Um, VETLIG system is uh, really interesting. I remember trialing it several years ago. Um, my personal feeling is certainly when I saw it and tried it is it was quite an extensive surgery at the time. We had certainly major issues with infection. Um, I think if it could be done uh, arthroscopically, yes, it could uh, be quite useful. Um, but it's a, uh, I, I think it's, we're, we're way off that. And I'm, I'm not convinced it's the right answer. The issue with uh, the vet league system, which for those that don't know, essentially um, tries to internally replace the cranial cruciate ligament, um, which is a great thing. It's something that they do in humans, but in humans, I suppose they've got a very different style of anatomy. They've got a much flatter tibial plateau um, than we do the nature of the disease is also slightly different. Um, in dogs, we tend to see some level of arthritis and the um, that sort of intertrochlear notch probably has some level of bone in there. I think we can still see wear of that ligament. Um, so for me, I think jury's out on that one. It's not something that I'm, I guess, expecting to have better results. Um, I'd be interested to see, but I, I don't really know. Um, uh, the, asking there for opinion on conservative treatment of cranial cruciate um, disease for cost reasons. Um, I think my honest opinion on it is, I guess, if you've got a dog that lives in a handbag, um, that doesn't really do very much walking, that's, you know, really small, then yes, maybe it works. Um, but essentially, if you've got an active dog, or you've got a um, I guess any sort of expectations of good function for the longer term that you it's a surgical disease that they do better um, with surgery. Um, so I guess that, that, that for me is, is something that I'd, I, I would say, yeah, if possible, I'd always go for surgery. Um, I mean, I wouldn't euthanize a dog based on, you know, they can't afford surgery or can't do surgery. Um, you know, you can certainly try it, but I have certainly seen dogs really struggle with arthritis, uh, progressive, quite marked arthritis and difficulties getting around over time as a result of that. Um, question here on sort of MMP versus traditional TTA. Um, they both work, use the same system. Um, I think therefore the sort of uh, ultimate results with it are pretty similar. I don't think there's much difference um, in terms of uh, the techniques. The issue I have with the MMP is actually 
revising an MMP is harder than revising a TTA because removing MMP implants is a lot more difficult. So I suppose that's a slightly biased view because I guess I have the potential that I might re revise them a bit more. I guess from a superiority or less uh, complex that MMP versus TTA from a functional outcome, they use the same biomechanical technique. Um, so they're roughly similar. I think the fixation is probably minimal with the MMP. So you're more likely to see complications or more major complications than with the TTA. But that again may depend on your, whether you're looking at traditional TTA or say the TTA rapid. Um, so I don't know if that answers that question. What do you think about TPLA surgery in cats with cruciate ligament disease? Uh, well, thanks, Christina. Um, I actually have done a couple of um, TPLOs on cats and it works really well. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think actually uh, it, it, it does work very well in, in, in cats. Uh, any other questions there? Uh, Dan's asking about how to do joint taps. Um, best one with that really is to uh, feel the patella ligament, um, put your sort of finger on one side um, and then aim for the middle of the joint um, just to the other side of the uh, patella ligament. Um, I'm not sure that gives a, a lot of obvious, but I think um, there was a talk on the 6th of January by John Innes, who looked at doing joint taps, Dan. So that might be a really good one for you to go back and have a look at. That was John Innes's talk. I think he, he talked about joint taps and there's probably be a bit more information um, uh, on there. Super. I think, I think that's all of the questions. So thank you everyone. Um, for joining. It's been great and uh, good night.